Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our speaker today is John Hilber. Uh, he was uh, the designated prof uh, this year to take our students to Israel, he and his wife, Charlotte. By the way, Charlotte, Charlotte, uh, raise your hand back here. And she's a professional counselor, so if you need a little therapy after John speaks today, uh, she's very free, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the thing I, uh, that I appreciate so much about John is that he's, he comes out of pastoral ministry. He's been in the pastoral ministry for 15 years and then did his doctoral studies and so on and um, in Old Testament, and he specialized interest of ancient background material in Old Testament studies. Just some trivia about him, he loves hiking and he likes bicycle riding and uh, just a regular guy, but he loves the Lord and he comes to us today to share some of God's word with us. Will you welcome Dr. John Hilbert? Thanks, Toby. Beginning uh, during my seminary studies back in the 80s, uh, I uh, was beginning to agonize over what I would eventually discover to be a series of tragic uh, losses uh, among uh, Old Testament uh, evangelical scholars. Now, uh, to appreciate some of the weight of this, you, you may uh, need to know that I, I don't know the statistics or the odds, but uh, those who uh, work uh, in Old Testament scholarship uh, who are uh, committed uh, evangelicals uh, is far, far and away the minority uh, in the mainstream of Old Testament uh, studies. Uh, New Testament uh, has it far better uh, than we do, but, uh, but we are uh, well outnumbered. Uh, and so just losing uh, one good scholar uh, is felt uh, in uh, the guild. Uh, J. Barton Payne, a name that some of you may know from uh, your reading in Old Testament, uh, written a well-known Old Testament theology, uh, 1979, uh, dies at the age of uh, 59 in a freak uh, mountain climbing accident on uh, Mount uh, Fuji. A few years later, uh, followed up by the death of Peter Craigie, who was one of the foremost uh, Ugaritic uh, specialists uh, in the world, uh, taught at the University of uh, Calgary. Uh, he was killed uh, just trying to cross the street in Toronto, uh, struck by a car. Uh, uh, died at the age of around 47, something like uh, that. Uh, then uh, came uh, Raymond uh, Dillard, uh, Westminster Theological Seminary of uh, fame. Uh, died of a heart attack. I'm um, thinking, uh, let's see, I broke down the obituary information. Uh, age uh, 49 uh, in 1993. Had just, had just uh, finished his work on a uh, standard uh, Old Testament introduction with Tremper Longman, uh, commentaries on Chronicles. Uh, godly, well loved man uh, dies of a heart attack suddenly. Uh, then uh, there was Gerhard Hassel a few years later, uh, one of the uh, few masters of, of all trades in Old Testament studies at Andrews uh, University, uh, killed in a car wreck uh, suddenly in uh, Utah. Uh, he was aged uh, 59. Uh, then uh, Thomas McComsky, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, he was uh, a young age of 68. You, know, you might not think that as young, but in Old Testament studies, uh, 68, you're just getting to the point where you can say something intelligent uh, about the field. Uh, uh, so uh, he, he was, uh, like all of these scholars, uh, in, in the flower uh, of their contribution uh, to the church from the wealth of their uh, academic work and their spiritual uh, lives, and all taken uh, tragically and suddenly and unexpectedly. Each of them were leaders in the field. Uh, and then uh, somewhat recently in 2005, Gerald Wilson uh, died uh, suddenly of a heart attack. Uh, he was age 60, a professor at Azusa Pacific, uh, one of the foremost experts in studies of the Psalms and has led the way in a, in a whole new paradigm of understanding the book of Psalms uh, as a book rather than just an anthology of individual uh, prayers. 
Uh, these were all uh, great uh, and godly men. Uh, every one of them is sorely missed, uh, not uh, just by their families, but by those of us uh, who knew them and uh, appreciate uh, the work uh, that they uh, had done. Each time, I would utter a complaint uh, to God uh, in my laments that there are already too few uh, evangelical Old Testament scholars. How can we afford uh, to lose uh, another one? Well, uh, my interest uh, this morning is not uh, in trying to answer the question that all of you might be wondering about as to why uh, this has happened. I'm not going to address that. My uh, interest this morning uh, is to just make the observation and deal with the text that touches on the topic, the strange uh, principle, it would seem, that God is pleased uh, to frequently use uh, the fewest possible uh, against all odds uh, to accomplish uh, his purposes. Why is it that it seems like uh, Christian service is always uh, a swim upstream uh, against uh, the current uh, and the flow of life uh, and uh, the times? Uh, whether it's Elijah on Mount Carmel uh, against the prophets uh, of uh, Baal uh, and Asherah, or whether it's Gideon and his 300 against the hordes of Midianites and Amalekites, uh, it seems uh, true frequently that God uh, is pleased uh, to uh, use a few uh, courageous individuals against uh, all odds. And so I'd like us to focus uh, this morning on Judges 7, which picks up uh, Gideon and his uh, 300. So if you turn with me, please, to uh, Judges uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Now, this uh, chapter brings to a head uh, the conflict that Israel was having with the Amalekites uh, and uh, the uh, Midianites who were uh, coming from the east of the Jordan River and uh, uh, raping and pillage and ransacking everything uh, that they had uh, from time uh, to time. And uh, uh, Gideon is called by God. It says, then, uh, Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all the people who uh, were with him arose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod. Uh, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley, about five miles away uh, to uh, the north. And if you just glance over to verse 12, we find out that the Midianites and Amalekites were numbered like locusts or like the sands of the sea. Uh, the odds were clearly uh, against them. Uh, Gideon had an army of 22,000 uh, at that point uh, against uh, the unnumbered uh, hordes. Verse 2, Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are too many for me to give the Midianites into, the hand, uh, into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, uh, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Uh, then 22,000 of the people returned uh, and 10,000 remained. Right, 33,000 was, uh, or 32,000 was the original number. Now, uh, at this point, God is, uh, is uh, playing, if you will, against a major fear uh, uh, factor in the life of Gideon. Now, if you were to turn back to chapter 6, verse 15, when he's first called, he says, my clan is the weakest, uh, trying to give excuses to not uh, come forward at the opportune moment. In verse 27 of uh, chapter 6, uh, his first duty to destroy the uh, altars of Baal and uh, Asherah uh, was marked by uh, him being too afraid, the text says, and so he went to do it uh, by night. Gideon was a fearful man, and when God decided to start uh, knocking out his numbers, uh, he was, uh, if you will, forcing Gideon out of his comfort zone uh, in a big uh, sort of way. Uh, 32,000 was too many, so let's send those who are fearful home. A little bit of a dig there, I think, in, into Gideon. Uh, are you fearful? Uh, go home. So 22,000 return, and so Gideon's left with 10,000. And then the Lord said uh, to Gideon, the people are still too many. I'm, I could imagine what uh, Gideon is saying at that moment, but I won't repeat it because we're being uh, recorded. 
And so uh, he, the Lord says to him, take them down uh, to the water and I will test them for you there. And anyone among you, uh, 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 anyone uh, of whom I say to you, this one uh, shall go with you, shall go with you. And any uh, one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, uh, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And then the Lord says to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set uh, by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands uh, to their mouths, were 300, but all the rest of the people knelt down uh, to drink. Uh, and the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets and they sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, uh, but retained 300 men and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley with the unnumbered hordes uh, against uh, 300. Now, th th I know this is a notoriously uh, confusing text as to what actually happened in the sorting process. Uh, what is it, you know, that those were kneeling and those that were dipping by the hand. And fortunately, uh, Chaplain Bill only gives me 10 minutes this morning, so I get to dodge that bullet of trying to sort uh, this problem out, uh, whether the uh, difficulty in translation or a textual garbling in one of those uh, in occasional places where that happens. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to solve that problem. Uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, as well, uh, the text is clear uh, in any event what is going on here. Uh, the Lord wants to make sure uh, that when victory comes, that the glory does not go to uh, the proud uh, numbers, but the glory would go to himself and his strength would be evident uh, to all at that point. Uh, God is not going to leave any doubt as to whose strength brings deliverance against all odds. God would use a courageous few uh, to accomplish his purpose. Uh, it takes only a few. Sometimes it takes only one uh, to make a difference uh, when they're instruments in the hands uh, of an almighty uh, God. Uh, there are times uh, in all of our lives uh, when we feel that we are up uh, against uh, the odds. Uh, perhaps uh, at your workplace, uh, there are conversations that take place uh, among the group. Perhaps there are uh, practices uh, that happen uh, in the corporate culture uh, where you reside that shouldn't be. And it takes uh, courage uh, to stand out and to speak up for that which is honorable uh, or that uh, which uh, is just. There are times you find yourself uh, in uh, the minority, in a ministry setting, uh, in a church, on a ministry team, uh, where uh, you uh, are taking up a position uh, of what ought to be done against what maybe the mainstream uh, wants uh, to do. Uh, sometimes you hold a minority opinion uh, on an elder board uh, and you have to stand for your convictions uh, and what you know is uh, the right uh, course uh, of action. Maybe uh, it's your family of origin. Uh, and there are certain patterns that happen over and over again, and you have to take your stand and, uh, and be and do uh, differently uh, than what the usual family script is for all of you uh, to play out uh, in the family. But it only takes one. It only takes one uh, in the hand of God uh, to bring change in all of these uh, situations. It takes courage to be different and to not uh, give up. I spent most of my ministry life in Washington State. Uh, at the time, it was the least churched state in the country. Uh, I read numbers as low as 5%. Uh, I think now the, some of the New England states have surpassed uh, Washington in the degree of paganism. Uh, so it no longer holds that uh, illustrious place. Gallup polls says 30% uh, go to uh, church in Washington recently. I don't believe it. I grew up there, spent most of my life there. You ask somebody, somebody where they went to church on Sunday, they're as likely to say Mount Rainier as First Baptist. Uh, when you uh, leave this area, you realize we are not in Dallas anymore, Toto. Uh, the, the, world, the world out there is really different. Uh, and there are places when you think that uh, you are against all odds, and there are places in the world where you go 
uh, where you know that you are against uh, all odds. Uh, but take courage because God uh, is a God who stands against all odds. And he's looking for a courageous few uh, in his hand uh, who will stand up and be his instruments uh, for his purposes. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the strength that you uh, can give us uh, in the face of whatever uh, is needed. Uh, Lord, we pray that you give us conviction uh, and courage when we are against uh, a mainstream that uh, runs against it, uh, us, whether it be our families, our uh, church situations, ministries, or our broader culture that is increasingly uh, picking up the pace and the current uh, against uh, your uh, kingdom. And so we ask for your strength and your help to use us mightily uh, as you did Gideon and his 300. In Christ's name, amen.